Well, today is uh, first Advent Sunday. As was mentioned earlier, it's the first Sunday in the Christmas Advent season. We even have a candle here. Obviously, candles are nice because of the dark, cold winter. Uh, and it's also a good uh, reminder. And we often then have, have candles even in the church. And it's often a practice, not always done, but Christians do like, you know, four candles, light one candle each Advent Sunday. And Advent uh, means this Christmas time, but also in a larger content, referring to the fact that we are awaiting, we're waiting for the arrival of someone. We are waiting for the arrival of someone. Not just any someone, but specifically that someone is the promised one, the Lord Jesus Christ, who we celebrate at Christmas. We celebrate Christ, the birth of Christ at Christmas. And uh, today we will continue in our normal series in the book of Genesis. So I'm not yet doing kind of a special sermon, so to say, uh, about uh, Christmas related themes. We continue just where we are in our normal series in the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, and we'll be in chapters 30 and also 31. But before we look at that, I want to make a connection, not just for the sake of it being Christmas, but it's an appropriate time, it's a relevant time. That this we now have the first Advent Sunday, and soon will be the first, uh, what date is it even today? Today is the 27th, but soon it will be the 1st of December. Many of you probably children have Advent calendars. Maybe of you adults even have Advent calendars. And there's not just the four Sundays leading, but even each day has a number, and you're opening this uh, Advent calendar uh, little windows, whether chocolate or something else. And there's this idea of waiting. And children especially then often wait for the gifts they will receive then. And it might seem like it's a long time of waiting. It is a very good, uh, the Bible as such doesn't teach us that we need to observe Christmas in a certain specific way. It tells us that Christ was born and it, the most significant event but it is very appropriate, some of these traditions that have developed and they're good and right. And, and this idea of waiting is a very biblical idea. And uh, I don't think we sometimes give it enough thought. And as we are in Genesis, we are in the midst of that waiting. And that waiting was way longer than 24 days or 25 days uh, in an Advent calendar. That waiting was a lot longer. And that waiting began right after the first sin when Adam and Eve sinned and God gave the original uh, first promise and that curse to the serpent Satan that the seed of the woman will one day crush the head of the serpent. So the seed of the woman will one day come. And he will. And, and, and then God gives more and more promises. He, he uh, makes a covenant with Noah and uh, it kind of starts over after the worldwide flood in a certain way. Uh, Noah is like a second Adam a little bit. But then after Noah, then he calls Abram and changes his name to Abraham and he gives that promise uh, that in you, in Abraham, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And then we've seen, we've looked at all this as we go through Genesis, Abraham, then Abraham has a son, Isaac, the promised one, and then Isaac has a son, uh, Jacob. And we are in the middle of the story of Jacob, the history of the life of Jacob. And sometimes it might seem like now, you know, in just in a while we'll get back to the story. We might be like, why are we learning this? Why are we going through this? Why do we need to know all these details about this man Jacob a long time ago? Well, simply, the short answer is because it's in the Bible. <laughs> because it is the Word of God. We as Christians believe the Bible is the Word of God. So that's why 
That's the short and simple answer. But also then, well, well why is it? And what's the, what's the, how is it connected to the rest of the story? How, it is, how is it connected to Christmas even? How is it connected to the fact that we are Christians? We believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I've reminded you every now and then, and I want to remind you again today and read a few verses from Matthew's Gospel before we turn back to Genesis 30. The first book in the New Testament, Matthew's Gospel, uh, often, you know, the beginning of Matthew is read during Christmas time, uh, especially there, verse 18 onwards, the birth of Jesus, uh, how it took place, obviously also from Luke, uh, people often read. But then this aspect that comes before, this long list of names is often skipped because it's thought of a little, well, it's a little bit maybe more boring. And I understand, uh, <laughs> of course, it is a long list of names and in that sense, it is maybe on the surface a little bit more boring, but it is important, it's significant. And so Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, begins with these words, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. Like we sang in that song, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, one of my favorite songs. They're the key of David. He's the promised one from David. He will come and open wide our heavenly home. The, he's the son of David. Jesus, the son of David. Then it says, he's the son of Abraham. These two key figures are pointed right at the beginning. And then from there, Matthew gives from Abraham all the way to Jesus. Uh, and specifically then Joseph and, and Mary there as the parents of uh, Jesus. Jesus, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac and Isaac the father of Jacob and Jacob the father of Judah. So when we come into the New Testament, sometimes even Christians have this wrong idea like, oh, we're Christians, we just... We just believe the New Testament almost, <laughs> like, which is a very foolish thing to, to say or believe. Because you have no New Testament without the Old Testament. Then the very beginning of the New Testament gives you a list of names, which without the Old Testament you'll be like, what? Like you have no clue how like, the whole thing started. How the waiting of this one. One of the reasons I really like that song, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, that there's this aspect of waiting. O Come, O Come, Come. And, and uh, come to Israel and so forth. Uh, the waiting began before even Israel existed. Jacob, who we are studying now, Jacob is the one whose name is later uh, changed to Israel and his 12 sons are the 12 tribes of Israel and obviously that's a big portion of the Old Testament but that waiting for the promised one started all the way right after the first sin and that promise to Adam and Eve and then to Abraham and so forth. Not only does the Gospel of Matthew start with this genealogy and it's very important that Jesus is born from this specific genealogy, this specific line uh, of descendants to show that he is the promised one son of Abraham, son of Isaac, son of Jacob, son of Judah and, and David and so forth but Jesus himself also let me show you two other passages briefly in Matthew uh, Matthew chapter 8 verse 11 <clears throat> Matthew chapter 8, verse 11, Jesus, as he is uh, rebuking the religious leaders of Israel, and as he's uh, done some of these miracles and said different things, he tells here in verse 11 of Matthew 8, I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. 
while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown out into outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And the centurion, and to the centurion, Jesus said, Go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. As he was uh, commending the fate of this centurion, this, this non-Jewish uh, person. And he's rebuking these religious leaders. But notice also here for Jesus, it's not only even... First of all, Jesus believed Abraham, Isaac and Jacob were real historical figures. He believed everything in the Old Testament, so we should believe that. And not only that, he draws from it and he refers to it. He's a descendant of them. And he even speaks about the future. That in the future, all those who trust in God, all those who are true believers, whether from the Old Testament times or New Testament times or still today, they will come, as he says, and recline at the table, share that with the meal and share in the fellowship of God himself. And specifically these three well-known figures, patriarchs from the Old Testament, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. While then the sons of the kingdom will be thrown out into outer darkness, as he says, just because you are physical descendants of Israel doesn't mean that just because of that you will be saved, but you need to have the same faith as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So these are real historical events, people, and Jesus refers to them and uses, his, uses them and refers to them many times throughout his teaching. And let's look at one more uh, in Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 22, verse 32. <clears throat> so Matthew chapter 22, and let me begin reading there from verse 29. But Jesus answered them, You are wrong because you know neither the Scriptures nor the power of God. Let me just stop there briefly. Jesus is again, he's having this uh, debate essentially with these religious leaders in Israel. And he tells them because of their questions and as they're denying the resurrection and they're trying to have this kind of theological debate with Jesus. Jesus says, you're wrong. And why, why are they wrong? Because they neither know the, the scriptures nor the power of God. They knew the scriptures in many, many ways, but Jesus says, you, you don't. <laughs> You're not rightly interpreting it. You're not rightly paying attention to even the, some of the details and just the big picture of scripture. Jesus believed the Old Testament. We should believe the Old Testament if we call ourselves Christians. He says, you are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. And what does he then use as an argument here? What does he say? He says, verse 30, For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? Have you not read? Have you not, you know, read? This Old Testament that you claim to believe in? Verse 32. What does, what, have, what does he say? Have you not read this? I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. So not only does Jesus believe these are historical events and, and, and all that, he believes the Old Testament says that people are wrong because they, neither know, they don't know the scriptures and the power of God. But he also makes a very big theological point from essentially the tense of a verb uh, there that whether God has been or is. Notice what Jesus says, the fact that God starts calling himself, uh, one of his kind of titles, the way God is referred to, is that he's the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God called Abraham, Abraham a man, 
a faithful man, but had his faults and his weaknesses and sins, as we've seen already in the life of Abraham, certainly not a perfect man. Then his son Isaac, promised one, faithful man, godly man, but with a lot of faults again, and some of the, even doing the same things as his father Abraham, but even worse, with deception and lying and such. And then Jacob, who we will get to back in just a moment, and we've seen the worst parts of Jacob and his flat-out lying and deception. Yet, God is faithful to his promise, and God still calls himself, even by this title, he's the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Jesus' point here is, the text doesn't say he was the God of Abraham, or was, like in the past sense. That because Jacob is no longer alive on earth at this point, or obviously long gone, long gone before. So Jesus' point is, God still calls himself by, by this uh, title, and therefore Jacob is still in existence. He is with God. He has died, yes, but he is with God. And ultimately await, we await future resurrection, just like Abraham is with God Jacob is with God, Isaac is with God, and every true believer is with God, even in the present. They haven't ceased to exist. There is a future resurrection. So Jesus refers to these and tells people that they were wrong because they don't take God at His word, even in the smallest details. And so it is important for us to seek to understand that which God has revealed. And that includes some of these uh, historical details in the life of now specifically Jacob. Like, well, well, who was this Jacob that Jesus is a descendant? Who was this father of the 12 tribes of Israel and what happened and why is it important that we know some of these details well God seems to think it is important God seems to think it is important and therefore that's what we're gonna continue today looking at the life of Jacob in Genesis chapter 30 and verse 25 onwards so that's where we pick up the story of Jacob and his family. Genesis chapter 30, verse 25. Verse 25 reads, As soon as Rachel had born Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, Send me away, that I may go to my own home and country. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you, that I may go, for you know the service that I have given you. Let's stop there. And brief reminder, Jacob, we saw last time Jacob has had now 11 sons, 11 tribes have been born. Well, they're not really tribes yet, but you know, they're uh, boys, uh, the oldest one of them would be probably like seven at this point, but and, and then even younger, so uh, you know, young children. But there's 12 of them. We've went through all the names, or 11, excuse me, 11 at this point. Then Benjamin is born a little bit later in chapter 35. He will be the the youngest in the 12 tribes then. But 11 tribes have been born, these 11 boys have been born. And now, as Rachel, the love of Joseph's, uh, love, uh, not Joseph, Jacob, Jacob's life, as she finally gives birth to Joseph, the only one at this point who is her own child, then Jacob says this to Laban, his father-in-law send me away and so what we have now today as we look at these verses all the way and then uh, chapter 31 is this change in uh, the history of Jacob and Jacob's family he's been there now we'll see in total 
he would have been there 20 years serving under Laban and all the deception and different things that happened and with, you know, being uh, suddenly he has two wives instead of one and all the problems that they were caused and all of that ultimately because of his own sin earlier as he deceived his own father and lied to his father. Now we will start seeing this change as Jacob and his family are going to leave leave uh, from under Laban and go back to the promised land, go back to the land of Isaac. And there's some strange things here. As I'll continue reading, and I'm just saying, there's, I, I've, many times when I've read the scriptures at this point, and I'm like, what is Jacob doing here? <laughs> what is he doing? What's going on with these sheep? I don't know much, you know, now I have two sheep, but I, don't, I still don't know too much about animals and sheep. But then it's like, even if you don't know much, you're like, what's happening here? Uh, and what's the point of this? And what are we to learn from all of this? Well, I hope to shed some light as we go through this text here now. But it begins with this. He wants to leave and he gives this request to Laban. And that, give me my wives and my children whom I have served you for that I may go, for you know the service that I have given you. And then verse 27 says, But Laban said to him, If I have found favor in your sight, I have learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. Name your wages and I will give it. Jacob said to him, You yourself know how I have served you and how your livestock has fared with me. For you had little before I came, and it has increased abundantly. And the Lord has blessed you wherever I turned. But now, when shall I provide for my own household also? He said, what shall I give you? Jacob said, You shall not give me anything. If you will do this for me, I will again pasture your flock and keep it. Let me pass through all your flock today, removing from it every speckled and spotted sheep and every black lamb and a spotted and speckled among the goats, and they shall be my wages. So my honesty will answer for me later when you come to look into my wages with you. Everyone that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and black among the lambs, if found with me, shall be counted stolen. Laban said, Good, let it be as you have said. But that day Laban removed the male goats that were striped and spotted, and all the female goats that were speckled and spotted, every one that had white on it, and every lamb that was black, and put them in the charge of his sons. And he set a distance of three days' journey between himself and Jacob. And Jacob pastured the rest of Laban's flock. Let me stop there. What's going on here? What's going on here? Well, first of all, Laban, as he responds there, notice he says, basically, if I have found favor in your sight, Laban is saying, if, if, I be, if, you've, if I've been good to you and you, know, you want to be good to me and kind to me, uh, you know, stay with me. He doesn't want him to go yet. Why doesn't he want Jacob to go? Well, he says he's learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. He, he understands that God, Yahweh, the one true God, has the, the reason that Laban has now big flocks and a lot of animals. And, you know, we might not think, oh, well, animals, that's not important. But, you know, basically that would be money. <laughs> that would be value. That's uh, uh, riches uh, to have all this. So he has, he has become a lot richer through the fact that Jacob has been working for him. 
And he specifically says that by divination, and this is interesting, divination is not a good thing in scripture, in the Bible. Divination uh, is connected to basically uh, witchcraft or uh, fortune tellers or uh, reading omens and such. And later on, uh, for example, in Leviticus 19 verse 26, it's uh, prohibited. And let me just read it to you briefly. Leviticus 19 uh, verse 26. You shall not eat any flesh with blood, with the blood in it. I believe that's connected to even earlier, the Noahic covenant. But anyway, and then he says, you shall not interpret omens. What's here translated as interpreting omens is the same uh, word and the idea of divination, interpreting omens, or tell fortunes, which is essentially connected again to witchcraft and different kind of uh, spiritual uh, um, evil practices. Verse 27, you shall not round off the hair of your temples or mar the edges of your beard. You shall not make any cuts on your body for the dead or tattoo yourselves. I am the Lord. Then he, let me read a few more verses because it connects again to this uh, witchcraft and such. Do not profane your daughters by making her a prostitute, lest the land fall into prostitution and the land become full of depravity. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. And then verse 31. Do not turn to mediums or necromancers. Do not seek them out and so make yourselves unclean by them. I am the Lord your God. So the scriptures, uh, the Bible tells us against this divination, this kind of witchcraft and, and seeking to contact like the spirits of the dead and, and all, all these kind of mediums and necromancers and all that. It says, do not do that. That's evil, that's wrong, and there's a real thing. Uh, for, first of all, like it's deceptive, but also there's demons lying and scheming behind and some of these things might really even happen and such but it's not a good thing you might even get answers you might even get answers that are sometimes even right answers but that doesn't mean you're allowed to do it and it's good demons know a lot of true things they do know they do know they know that the one true god that who he is and they tremble yet they do not uh, submit and believe in Him. They, they are in rebellion against God. And here, uh, Laban doesn't say how, what kind of divination, how did he find this out? But somehow he find, found this out, and the, the, what he found out is true. Yes, Yahweh has blessed Laban because of Jacob. It is true, God Himself says that. So it's a true answer, but it's not uh, meant to teach us that it was right what Laban said, uh, did in divination. In fact, we'll see in just in a few more verses, we'll see that Laban, even though he every now and then gives at least lip service to the one true God, Yahweh, but he also has his household gods, his idols, and so forth. So he, he uh, is not uh, being truly faithful in worshipping God for as, as Jacob is, but he worship, worships false gods. Anyway, but God has blessed Jacob beca uh, Laban because of Jacob. And this is part of what God said to Abraham in the beginning. Those who bless you, I will bless, and those who curse you, I will curse. There is this idea all the way from the original promise. So that's why, just pragmatically, basically Laban, it's not, it's not going to be good for Laban's business if his son-in-law Jacob leaves. Because he understands that the blessing that he is getting also is just essentially an overflow of what is God is doing to Jacob. It's because Jacob is there that Laban is also reaping some benefits. So he says... 
Tell me what I will pay you and, uh, and I will give you. And here is now, Jacob gives him an interesting answer. And this is the first point here. I think it's a strange agreement. They make an agreement, they make a deal. And it's a bit like strange. Why? Why does Jacob say this? So we see here these verses that I read from 25 to 36. I would say it's essentially a strange agreement. Then we'll see in verses 37 to 43, we'll see some strange actions. I believe, you know, strange actions that Jacob does. And I believe it's on purpose a little bit strange what's happening there. Then later on, in the beginning of this next chapter, 31, we'll see the secret revelation, which I believe is the reason that Jacob in the first place says this. Jacob knew something that Laban didn't know, and we don't even know at this point as we're reading the text. We are told it later by Jacob, as well, as we read, as Jacob tells his wives, Leah and Rachel, this, he tells them about this dream that he had and how God revealed this to him. So what Jacob is doing, as he's making this agreement, and as he's doing these actions, as we read the whole text, we'll find out that the, way, the reason he was doing this in the first place was because he knew something. He had revelation. God had spoken to him and told him certain things. And that's why he's making this agreement that seems strange. And that's why he's making even these strange actions. But he basically says... Okay, okay I, I don't ask for anything else, but give me basically a little bit the leftovers of the flock. So these are apparently uh, the sheep in this area, even apparently still today, uh, are most often of the time sheep are normally white. I mean, even in Finland, probably, I don't know the statistics, but... A, a big portion probably are white, although we have Kainu Harmas, and for example, the two sheep that we have at home are not white, they're uh, black or gray or dark, and there's different kinds. But as we see here, the normal sheep normally were just white, and some of them, a small minority of them, would have then different patterns on them and different colors also. And then it seems goats were normally black than the opposite. And what Jacob is here saying that these are the, this is the norm. The vast majority of the sheep are white. The vast majority of the goats are black. And he says basically, let's make a deal that I get the ones that are the strange ones. The strange ones. You know, we uh, sometimes use the idea of the black sheep of the family, the black sheep of the family. What does that mean? It means that it's the weird one. <laughs> it's the odd one. All, all the other ones are white, and then there's one that sticks out. Which one is the one that sticks out? The black sheep of the family. Uh, and uh, that's the idea here. Sheep's normally white, goats uh, normally black. These are the ones that sticks out that there's not many of them. Ultimately, as Jacob has said, the fact that Laban has all this livestock in the first place is because, because of Jacob. So he deserves a lot more. He deserves a much bigger share of these riches. But he says, let's make this deal. I'll get the weird ones. I get the ones that stick, stick out and there's not many of them. And Jacob said there, as I read verse 33, so my honesty will answer for me. I think Jacob, certainly not a perfect man yet either, but I believe he's learned a lot. He's learned about his deception, how he deceived and lied to his father. And he's seen how that deception, he was now deceived by Laban. And now he has two wives and the wives fight their sisters and the whole family is a mess. Everything is a bit disunified and, and he's suffering the consequences of it. So he's now like, my aunt, I will be faithful. I, I will, you know, I, I've learned my lesson. And, and, and he's not seeking to uh, deceive uh, 
Laban in any way here. But he knows something Laban doesn't know. As we'll find out in just a moment. But he gives this, let's do this deal. And then, if, then all the ones that have these special marks will be mine, and those that don't are yours. And then it's easy to say that, because if, if he had some of the white, and he had some of the white, then have you stolen my sheep or not? You know, like, no, it, it will be easy to see. You can see their different colors, and then the white, fully white sheep are yours, which almost all of them are, and uh, the black goats are yours, but the one with all these funny colors or shapes and patterns are mine. He says, good, let it be as you have said. So Laban is like, okay. So, you know, you're probably thinking a little bit strange deal, but it sounds good to me because from a human point of view, it, 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 it sounds like a good deal. It's like, it's reasonable, you know, okay, if that's what you want to do. Good, let it be as you have said. But even though he says that, it seems to be here that Laban still does something and deceives Jacob. It seems, as you read the text, that the point was what Jacob was saying, that he knew that there were some already, not many, but let's go, and, and he will take them to the side, and he will start with those, and then more, if come, will be his. But then it seems that Laban is wanting to make it even harder for him. That's what verse 35, but that day Laban removed the male goats, that were striped and spotted, and the female goats that were speckled and spotted, and every one that had white on it, every lamb that was black. He removed them, and he didn't remove them to give them to Jacob, but he removed them to put in charge of his son. So what seems to happen here is he does, kind of without uh, Jacob n knowing, he tells whatever his servants, and they do this, and, and then, that when, then later when Jacob comes, that there, oh, there's even less than kind of maybe he thought. Basically, there's none left. <clears throat> so he deceives, Laban continues deceiving. And it's going to be even harder. And then these, Laban's sons take these, and Laban's other flocks are then three days' journey away from Jacob. There's a big distance here. Three days' journey. And then Jacob continues pasturing the rest of Laban's flock. But a strange agreement. Jacob says he wants the abnormal ones, the, 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 the ones that there's not many of. Why did he make this agreement? And what, why does he do the things that he's going to do here? It gets even stranger. Verse 37, what happens? Then Jacob took fresh sticks of poplar and almond and plain trees. So of these different three trees, he takes sticks, branches. He peeled white streaks in them, exposing the white of the sticks. So he has these sticks and which are then, it seems fresh, uh, and he's making streaks, so there's like patterns on them, and also the inside of the stick uh, is now exposed. And verse 38, he set the sticks that he had peeled in front of the flocks in the throws, that is, the watering places where the flocks came to drink. And since they bred, when they came to drink, the flocks bred in front of the sticks so that the flocks brought forth striped, speckled, and spotted. And Jacob separated the lambs and set their faces, set the faces of the flocks toward the striped and all the black in the flock of Laban. He put his own droves apart and did not put them with Laban's flock. Whenever the stronger of the flock were breeding, Jacob would lay the sticks in the throws before the eyes of the flock that they might breed among the sticks. But for the feebler of the flock, he would not lay them there. So the feebler would be Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. Thus the man increased greatly and had large flocks, female servants and male servants and camels, and donkeys. What's going on here? Is this some basically 
magic? <laughs> is this some kind of uh, like magical sticks? And uh, Jacob knows some special uh, magical uh, formula, and that's why these things happen. Is this meant to teach us that Jacob somehow knew a way to do things and to get certain results because of these sticks and his own intellect and skill and that alone? Is that what it's saying? Is this kind of like superstition almost? And, and that's what's happening here. What's happening with these sticks? I would say no, none of those. Because of what we will see in just a moment as he tells this uh, dream that he had and as he said that God has caused the flock to give birth to this if if then uh, Laban has made this deal and if Laban has changed his wages ten times in verse 18 uh, verse 18 chapter 21 he says if Laban said the spotted shall be your wage then all the flock were spotted and if he said the striped shall be your wage then all the flock were striped thus God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me and then he gives that dream which we'll get to in just a moment but the whole point here as we read this is that God supernaturally gave over this riches and this flock slowly to Jacob. The emphasis is not on Jacob knowing some secret thing on his own, some like he has some special scientific knowledge or something like that, and that alone causes the result. No, it is the fact that God is doing this and specifically that God told Jacob this before he started doing this. But it is strange that he does these actions. Why does he do these actions? Why doesn't then, if it is so, as we'll see in just a moment, that God says it, that this will happen, and God is the one doing it, why, does, why is it not just so that, okay, Jacob makes the deal, and then he just is not involved, like he just, you know, does the kind of other normal parts of a shepherd and taking care of the sheep. But why does he have to be actively doing something with some of these sticks and so forth? And that's the way that still uh, outwardly looking this happens. I believe it is uh, to, to emphasize also the strangeness of this agreement and the strangeness of what's happening, but also that even though God is doing this, even though God is doing this and God is making Jacob rich through this, that Jacob is involved and Jacob has his part and he even does these a little bit strange things, which I would think that God told him to do, even we're not specifically told about these sticks, but he uses them as a certain sign. And maybe the sticks had, you know, it's been theorized. Then, okay, maybe the sticks kind of caused that as they drank the water and from, the, from the sticks and such that, that they, um, they were basically more in the mood of mating then. Like it caused sexual drive in these animals and, and that kind of helped. Uh, okay, maybe. But just the fact that they see sticks that have stripes is no way like... It's not, that's not how it works, that suddenly the children are stripy because you see stripy patterns. No. But he's putting this, and he's specifically also then, he's specifically doing the, the strong ones, and when he puts the sticks there, when he's involved in doing this, then these specific ones which he has chosen, and when he puts the stick, sticks, these uh, livestock give birth to the ones that are patterned in a way that will go to him. And then when he doesn't, they are not going to be striped ones. And yeah, they still have offspring also, but they're the more feeble ones. So he kind of lets, he takes care of the bare essentials and takes care of Laban sheep, but he doesn't do this specific thing with them, which causes uh, a lot of these uh, different colored, dark, speckled, striped ones to appear. So it is strange actions that he does, and it's a strange deal that he has done, 
But I believe the reason he has done this is again because God gave him a vision before all of this. God gave him this vision and so he's operating from this knowledge that Laban doesn't know. We don't even know until we read it in the beginning of chapter 31. But he is involved and he is not just being passive but ultimately the results are up to God. God is the one who gives uh, life to even these animals. He's the one who opens the womb of even these animals, just like, the, just like he's the one who opened the womb of Rachel, just in the previous few verses there in chapter 30, verse 22. Then God remembered Rachel, and God listened to her and opened her womb. God is the one who gives life, and here, in a very unusual, unique way, he suddenly starts giving these to these sheep, these special colored ones uh, that will go to Jacob. If Laban would have known this, he would not have made this deal. <laughs> but it's because God is in this unique way giving now Jacob. Well, verse 1 of... <clears throat> Chapter 31 has a little brief thing here in between. Now Jacob heard that the sons of Laban were saying, Jacob has taken all that was our father's, and from what was our father's he had gained this wealth. And Jacob saw that Laban did not regard him with favor as before. Then the Lord God said to Jacob, Return to the land of your fathers and to your kindred, and I will be with you. So basically this, this uh, battle and this uh, tension between Laban and Laban's sons and then Jacob and Jacob, it's getting stronger and stronger. It's, uh, from a human point of view already, it's kind of beginning to be like, oh, you need, something needs to happen. Uh, there's tension in the air. And Yahweh speaks to da Jacob and says, you need to return. It's time to return. And here now, verse 4 we're told the secret revelation as he tells this to his wives. So verse 4 in chapter 31. So Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah into the field where his, flocks, where his flock was and said to them, I see that your father does not regard me with favor as he did before, but the God of my father has been with me. You know that I have served your father with all my strength. Yet your father has cheated me and changed my wages ten times. But God did not per hit, permit him to harm me. If he said the spotted shall be your wages, then all the flock bore spotted. And if he said the striped shall be your wages, then all the flock bore striped. Thus God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me. In the breeding season of the flock, I lifted my eyes and saw in a dream that the goats that mated with the flock were striped, spotted, and mottled. Then the angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob, and I said, here I am. And he said, lift up your eyes and see all the goats that mate with the flock are striped spotted and mottled for i have seen all that laban is doing to you i am the god of bethel where you anointed a pillar and made a vow to me now now arise go out from this land and return to the land of your kindred let me stop there i was amazed also as how many bible interpretations bible commentators and as they go through this text how they disconnect this passage, this dream that now Jacob shares, and then when they think about the strange things that Jacob does with the sticks and the whole deal, and they kind of don't put them together. <laughs> and, so, and, and most of them seem to, at least the ones I read, seem to have almost this view, and one of them specifically even says, this commentator, that, that this vision must have been later. 
So like whatever the reason Jacob made that deal in the beginning and the reason he made with those sticks, then that all that had happened already and later on God gives this vision and tells him to see these things. And uh, this specific Bible commentator, very you know, respected, well-known academic and such. And he says, because we've not been, because he wasn't mentioned earlier, like it should have been mentioned earlier. Well, really? Uh, first of all, what does this even mean if, if Jacob has somehow just made a weird deal for whatever reason and does all these things and he's already having results because of his, you know, stick <laughs> plan? And then God gives him a vision after that. And God tells Jacob to look and see how the sheep are and the goats are giving this speculum. And it's a bit like, well, yeah, <laughs> because I've been doing it. You know, what's the point of Jacob knowing this afterward if it was a result of just Jacob's ingenuity or some kind of weird thing happening? What's the point? I would say there is no point. The whole point is that I believe Jacob is, even though he's telling it here to his wives, this is the thing that God told him in the beginning. That's why he made the deal in the first place. That's why he did the whole thing with the sticks. He knew something. God had revealed to him and said to him, Jacob, lift up your eyes and see all the goats that made with your flock are striped, spotted and mottled. For I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. So he gets this vision and that this is what's happened. And he's basically like the stripe, the spot and the mottled. So all the ones with weird patterns. So they're going to be giving birth to all those. And God will do that because he knows how Laban is mistreating him. Okay, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> and so that's why he makes the deal. Because God has told him that will happen. And... I, my guess would be that God even told him specifically, or, or maybe just Jacob used his own, like, okay, I'm going to be involved somehow, and he's going to use these sticks, but ultimately God is the one who did it. Or maybe even God told him to specifically go and put these sticks, and God has, God has told in many other places people to do weird things and look at weird things, you know, look at the bronze serpent and be healed. Like, like, how do you explain that? How do you explain? Well, it's simply you need to trust God at his word and trust God uh, as he says. So it was amazing to me how many people just don't put these two and two together. But I believe this is the key to understanding what Jacob is doing here. He's acting because of this. And I believe that's why he's telling his wives. That's why he's done this. God has given him this dream. And he said... That this is what the uh, livestock, the sheep and these goats will do. For I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. And verse 13 says, I am the God of Bethel. Bethel, remember, as he had the vision, the other vision there uh, in, in Bethel on his way many, many years before. Uh, where he put a pillar of stone and made the vow to God. He says, now arise and go out from this land and let, let, return to the land of your kindred. So the time has come to start his, uh, the preparation of his journey to start going back. And he's telling this to Rachel and Leah. Rachel and Leah, as we've seen, these sisters who are now both wives of uh, Jacob and the whole mess that they're in. And these two that have been essentially fighting with one another. Then R Rachel and Leah answered to him, Is there any portion or inheritance left to us in our father's house? Are we not regard regarded by him as foreigners? For he has sold us, and he has indeed devoured our money. All the wealth that God has taken away from our father belongs to us and to our children. Now then, whatever God has said to you, do. So, short, basically to summarize, both Rachel and Leah, who've been in disagreement and fighting and all this, now they're in agreement with the fact that, yes, our father has not only acted wrongly against you as our husband and all this, but he's been scheming. But also, it seems he hasn't given what the normal customs would have been to give to their daughters and, and such. He's been stingy or devoured their money. And uh, so they, they are essentially in agreement. And in some ways, you could almost say that they now have these two women who uh, have been at war with one another a little bit and competing and difficulty in the marriage. Now they have a common enemy 
their own father, Laban, because of his des deception. And because they have a common enemy, it kind of unites them. But it's, it's still a sad situation. But they're in agreement. Yeah, let's do this. And they understand that God is taken away. They kind of see how, how God, God is doing this. And, and that Laban is getting uh, what he deserves. And first of all, the blessing that Laban w was given in the first place came from Jacob anyway. So they're on board. Let me... Uh, I'm going to try and get through this. <laughs> I have a lot of verses, but uh, let me read through here. Uh, from verse 17 onwards, what happens then? So Jacob arose and set his sons and his wives on camels. He drove away all his livestock, all his property that he had gained, the livestock in his possession that he had acquired in Padam Aram, to go to the land of Canaan to his father Isaac. Laban had gone to shear his sheep and Rachel stole her father's household gods. And Jacob tricked Laban the Aramean by not telling him that he intended to flee. He fled with all that he had and arose and crossed to the Euphrates and set his face to the hill country of Gilead. So now he starts his journey with everything that he has to go back to his father Isaac, back to Canaan, back to the promised land. And Laban is away, and he's probably three days away. Again, Laban's flock and his sons were three days away, so he's far away. Uh, and then, interesting, Rachel stole her father's household gods. Household gods, and this comes here later. We don't know why she stole them. Did she steal them because she was still partially following the bad practices of her father and kind of trusting in these false idols? Maybe some people theorized that maybe this was also like an inheritance seal that with this you would show that you are entitled to the inheritance. So it's almost like the taking the title deed of the house with you or something like that. Uh, although probably that wasn't the case. But some people think that might be what's happening here. Anyway, she takes them. And Jacob also tricks. So even though he's changed and he said, my honesty, there's still trick kind of deception a little bit in him. And unfortunately, so he, he could have just said, we're going now. It's time to leave. But he is fearful. And this is where we see the fear of Jacob. And he didn't have any reason to be afraid, but he was afraid. Humanly speaking, yes, reason to be afraid, but God is the one who just spoken to me, and God is the one who said, return to your land of your fathers, I will be with you. I will be with you. But he was still fearful. Verse 22 then continues here in chapter 31. When it was told Laban on the third day, notice because he's three days away, on the third day that Jacob had fled, he took his kinsmen with him and pursued him for seven days and followed close after him into the country of Gilead. But God came to Laban the Aramean in a dream by night and said to him, be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. And Laban overtook Jacob. Now Jacob had pitched his tent in the hill country and Laban and his kinsmen pitched tents in the hill country of Gilead and Laban said to Jacob what have you done that you have tricked me and driven away my daughters like captives of the sword why did you flee secretly and trick me and did not tell me so that I might have sent you with mirth and songs and with tambourine and lyre and why did you not permit me to kiss my sons and my daughters farewell now you have done foolishly. It is in my power to do you harm. But the God of your father spoke to me last night, saying, be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. And now you have gone away because you longed greatly for your father's house. But why did you steal my gods? Jacob answered and said to Laban, because I was afraid. For I thought that you would take your daughter, daughters from me by force. 
Anyone with whom you find the gods, your gods shall not live. In the presence of your kinsmen, point out what I have, what I have that is yours and take it. Now Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen them. So Laban went into Jacob's tent and into Leah's tent and into the tent of the two female servants, but he did not find them. And when he, and he went out of Leah's tent and entered Rachel's. Now Rachel had taken the household gods and put them in the camel's saddle and sat on them. Laban felt all about the tent, but did not find them. And she said to her father, let not my Lord be angry that I cannot rise before you, for the way of women is upon me. So he searched, but did not find the household gods. What's going on here? Well, I think the, one of the main things I want to point out here is we see this Jacob's fear. Jacob's fear. The reason he acted this way by leaving in secret and essentially then tricking his father-in-law as he says, he was afraid. He was afraid. Did he have reason to be afraid? No, not really, because God had said he would be with him. So we see his uh, uh, cowardice, his, his fear, and, and because of that, he's acting in this way. And they've been deceiving one another many times already, and just kind of the, the trickery continues. But he's afraid. He's afraid of Laban. Essentially more in this situation than he's, a, he's afraid of God and trusting God and God's promises. God appears to this Laban, this one who uses divination, this pagan. God appears to him and speaks to him and says, Do not speak to, uh, say to Jacob, either good or bad. It's interesting, earlier in Genesis 24, verse 50, just mentioned briefly there, Laban himself with Abraham's servant, he said that this is from God, we will not say anything good or bad. He, he, he recognizes that when God does something, you don't have anything to say one way or the other because it is what it is. God has done this. And uh, here God himself uses this same language that Laban himself had used earlier in Genesis 24. Rachel has stolen these household gods and uh, gods, plural, and Elohim, uh, which in other contexts can be a reference to the one true God, just like in English, God can be a false God or a true God. But notice the irony a little bit. This is a little bit mocking. Think about this. Rachel stole the gods. First of all, the gods can be stolen. And not only did she steal the gods, she's sitting on these gods and the gods are hiding under as she's sitting. It's, you know, a little bit, it's not so even a little bit, but it's kind of mocking dead idols. You know, like, the, yeah, the reason you can steal these ones is because they're not gods really at all. The reason you can even sit on them and a woman who's pre pretending then that oh, she has a menstrual cycle and that's why she can't get up, she's sitting uh, on top of these gods, which are no gods. Uh, but anyway, he's wanting to get them back. And later on in chapter 35 of Genesis, God will say, put away the false gods, and they all, whether it was these and others that they had among them. Tendency to do wrong. And obviously Rachel is deceiving here. She's doing things that her own husband did later, uh, earlier on, deceived his father. Now she is deceiving his own father, which is not right, which is not good. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, it's an unfortunate situation, but the deception continues in one way or another. The fear of Jacob. Okay, these last verses then from 36 to 55, I'll run through them here fast. We'll see another fear. We've seen the fear of Jacob, which is not a good thing, but we will see the fear of Isaac, which is a, a little bit strange thing. And it is a good thing. What's the fear of Isaac? Or who is the fear of Isaac? Isaac is the father of Jacob who is now acting fearfully. Yes, which was not right and good. But who is the fear of Isaac? 
What does that mean? Verse 36, let me read there onward. Then Jacob became angry and berated Laban. Laban said, Jacob said to Laban, What is my offense? What is my sin that you have hotly pursued me? For you have felt through all my goods. What have you found of all your household goods? See, set it here before my kinsmen and your kinsmen, that they may decide between us two. These 20 years I have been with you. Your youth and female, your female goats have not miscarried. And I have not eaten rams of your flock. What was torn by wild beasts I did not bring to you. I bore the loss of it myself. From my hand you required it, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. There I was by day, the heat consumed me, and the cold by night, and my sleep fled from my eyes. These twenty years I have been in your house. I served you fourteen years for your two daughters and six years for your flock. And you have changed my wages ten times. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had not been on my side, surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. God saw my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. Jacob gets a bit angry. He feels he's mistreated and... As he gets, you know, he feels he's been mistreated for a long time, as he has been mistreated. And he's suffered and he's been, you know, working faithfully. And yet he hasn't been getting essentially an, enough pay and loss and all this and difficulty as a shepherd and so forth. That's as he mentioned. And he's now been 20 years in totals. 14 for the daughters and it seems now 6 years for this flock that he now has. And he says, if God would not have with me, you know, if it was humanly speaking, if Laban got his way, Laban would have just sent him away empty-handed. Empty-handed. But says, God has been with me. And he says, the God of Abraham and the fear of Isaac. This is very interesting. The fear of Isaac. What does he mean with the fear of Isaac? He says it one more time here. Let me read the remaining verses and then spend a brief moment on this fear of Isaac. Verse 43. Then Laban answered and said to Jacob, The daughters are my daughters, the children are my children, the flocks are my flocks, and all that you see is mine. But what can I do this day for these my daughters or for their children whom they have born? Come now, let us make a covenant, you and I, and let it be a witness between you and me. So Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar, and Jacob said to his kinsmen, gather stones. And they took stones and made a heap. And they ate there by the heap. Laban called it Jagar Saha Dutha. But Jacob called it Galed. Laban said, this heap is a witness between you and me today. Therefore, he named it Galed and Mizpah. For he said, the Lord watch between you and me when we are out of, out of one another's sight. If you oppress my daughters, or if you take wives beside my daughters, although no one is with us, see, God is witness between you and me. Then Laban said to Jacob, See this heap and the pillar which I have set between you and me. This heap is a witness, and a pillar is a witness. And I will not pass over this heap to you, and you will not pass over this heap and this pillar to me to do harm. The God of Abraham and the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judge between us. So Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac. Jacob offered a sacrifice in the hill country and called his kinsmen to eat bread. They ate bread and spent the night in the hill country. Early in the morning Laban arose and kissed his grandchildren and his daughters and blessed them. Then Laban departed and returned home. Okay. 
what's happened? Basically, Laban, because if it was Laban himself, like Jacob says, if Laban got his way on his own, he would have no problem in just letting Jacob go without anything. And, uh, and, and he was a trickster, and, you know, well, Jacob himself had been a trickster and deceiver and so forth. So he, he, he's, he's not a, you know, good and just man in that sense. He would have no problem. But the reason he's acting this way and letting Jacob go, and the reason Laban is not taking revenge on Jacob, even though he said, you know, it is in my power to do you harm. He could have started like actually like fighting against him and he would have felt even somewhat justified maybe. The reason he's not doing that is because he's afraid of someone. Basically. Jacob was afraid of Laban. He should not have been. But Laban, even as a pagan, realizes who came to talk to him. God paid him a visit. God came and talked to him. And even though he doesn't seem to be a worshipper of the true God, he still realizes, and he realizes that this is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the one true God. And that's why Jacob calls him the fear of Isaac. God is the fear of Isaac. It causes fear in Laban, and not just in Laban, but in general. It causes dread. God is the most fearful one, of course. The fear of Isaac, his father. God is to be feared. God is the judge. He is the righteous one. And if God is against you, you have the re all the reason to be afraid. This reminds me, I was recently also watching with our boys, and Narnia, like the old BBC series of Narnia, some of you may have seen some of the new movies or read the books or whatever, or the old series. Either way, there's this one line in Narnia, uh, which is uh, very memorable and I remember often. There's this question, you know, Aslan is this lion figure, and Aslan is essentially allegory for uh, God, for Christ. And Aslan in Narnia then, and as they're having this conversation, I don't remember even who it's, someone is asking, was it Lucy or one of the little children, is Aslan safe? Is he safe? And then, was it the fawn or someone, I don't even remember who, but, but says, safe? Like, of course he's not safe, but he's good. Of course. Aslan isn't safe. He's terrifying. If you have to face Aslan, there's nothing more fearful. If you have to face God, there's nothing more fearful. Is God safe? No. He's the most terrifying one. He's only safe if you have peace with Him, if you, if, if you are His, if you belong to Him. He's not safe. He's not safe in the sense of a weak person who you can push around. Oh, it's fine. We don't have to care about him. It's safe, you know. Oh, even if he tried to do something, we're safe. We're fine because he can't do anything now. Aslan is not safe, but he's good. And if you trust him, if you are on Aslan's side, everything is all right. And the same and even more is true about God. God is certainly not safe, but he's good. He's good. He's righteous. He's the perfect one. And if you trust Him, if you believe in Him, and specifically if you believe in the one who is the descendant of Jacob, the Lord Jesus Christ, where we began, Jesus, who was born about 2,000 years ago, whether it was this time of year or not is really irrelevant, but he was born, it's a historical reality, and he is the promised one that, that we've been waiting all the way from the beginning of uh, creation and the first sin, and after that God promised that the seed of the woman will come, and he came 2,000 years ago, and he will one day come again. He is the one who is the fear of Isaac. He is the lion of Judah.
Judah being one of the sons of Jacob. And obviously there, Lion, Judah. You can see also where C.S. Lewis got some of his imagery even for Narnia, Aslan, the lion. God is faithful to his promises. God is faithful to his promises. He has been faithful from the beginning and he will be faithful to the end. His people often do foolish things and they suffer the consequences of it and God teaches them. God teaches them and God protects them. And uh, he has desired for us to know even some of these details that we might see the good things Jacob trusted God he did and even these weird things with the animals and God was faithful to his promise he was making Jacob great and his great Jacob's descendants and so forth God was blessing them and through them ultimately specifically Judah and Judas line in David then Jesus would come and through him blessing to all the families of the earth and that's what we know we know the whole story now At that point that they knew glimpses and they knew some of it they were waiting for the promised one we know the whole story well we still wait future fulfillment <laughs> when jesus will come again but that's what we celebrate at christmas and this is the god uh, we believe in and trust in so let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that you have spoken. You've revealed yourself. Thank you even for all these details, even in the Old Testament. Sometimes it might seem to us like, why do we have to know these? And what's the purpose of us uh, knowing what happened with Jacob or Rachel and, and Laban and even these? Yes, they're not the most important uh, as, as the gospel itself and knowing what Jesus Christ, the promised one. But even the full story on the full history of how you brought Jesus Christ into the world, that this is part of that story. And, and there's warning examples, and then there's good examples of them trusting you and trusting your word. And Lord, we thank you that you are God. You are the fear of Isaac. And we know that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. Lord, help us to have a right respect and an honor and a fear of you knowing that you are God you're not safe certainly not you're not safe you're the most terrifying one because you are the most powerful one but yet you are good you're perfect righteous and because of Jesus Christ the only one who is perfect and righteous the one who is good he gave his life as a ransom for sinners like us he died on the cross for sinners like us. He lived a perfect life and then he died that we might have forgiveness. We might be forgiven. And because of what Jesus has done, we can rejoice. Without Jesus, we would only have you as our judge and all the reason to be afraid and terrified. No peace with you, no, no grace, no forgiveness. We don't deserve it, but because of Christ, we can rejoice and we can sing uh, peace and, and joy and all these themes and words that we hear often repeated in Christmas time and Christmas song and even Christmas decoration. Joy to the world, the Lord has come and peace on earth. Why? Because Christ Jesus, the Lion of Judah, has finally come. Lord, help us to remember these things. Help us re rejoice in these things and to trust in you. And that in one way or another, as we prayed earlier in our service, that you would use us during this Christmas time to be a reminder to people around us that in this promised one there is blessing to all the families of the earth. All people who will turn to Jesus and believe in him, the promised one, will receive forgiveness and eternal life. So may we be vehicles and in some way, to bring this message to other people. These things we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.